Okay, but I want to know, did you always want to be a scientist? Well, you know, that's a great question. No. I started my professional life as a ballet dancer. Um, I took no science in high school, so I would probably be missing this presentation. Yep, terrible. <laughs> um, terrible. Um, I, that, which is why I'm a big advocate for keeping every student in science, because what I then did is I went back and had to do high school, more high school, and yep. then start university. But yes, I've always been very interested in the arts, and I did spend the first part of my professional life as a ballerina. Um, but yeah, biology has always been of, of interest background-wise, yeah. And what do you want to achieve with your biology career? I think that it's important for, um, for the world to have more information, for us to be able to tell stories and, you know, to be a professional science storyteller. Um, you know, a lot of times the scientists are busy doing their work, and so I think it's really important for there to be effective voices out there letting the world know what it is that they're doing and, and sort of telling things in a way that we can sort of learn to appreciate the biological world a little bit more. Because you're not just going out and talking to students, are you? You're talking to all sorts of people on your YouTube channel, those television programs that you're in. Yeah, I'm talking to anyone who will listen. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. We're yeah. all listening. We're all listening. And was it hard to actually change from that dancing career into a biology career? It happened very slowly. So when I started going to university, uh, I would always take dance, acting, art, um, and there was always one biology credit on the roster, just one. It wasn't until about third year that I actually made the full transition to science. So it was a slow transition. It happened just very organically. And if you could describe your work as an animal, <laughs> have a think about this question. Oh, I don't need to think about it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> easy. What would the animal be? So it's got to be a nudibranch. Always has that. It's my favorite animal on the planet. Those are the sea slugs I showed you, the stab, maybe not the stabbing penis head one, but so nudibranchs, I've always been fascinated by them for a few reasons. Beauty, I appreciate their natural beauty. They're so colorful, they're so amazing, they're so magnificent looking. Second, grace, they are so graceful. They glide, they move. The ones that swim, the Spanish dancer, for example, mm -hmm. will just glide through the water. Third, voracious. These are lethal predators. They are vicious. <laughs> yeah, I just Naughty love them. Naughty and nice at the same totally. time. Totally. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if you could answer one huge big question in science, what question would you try and answer? Gosh, that's, you know, that's a big one. There's a lot out there, I think, that merits knowing. I think if we could somehow work on questions relating to sustainability with a lot more success. For example, I know global warming is something that we all talk about, but I'm not sure that anybody really has the answer. And in fact, I, I'm fairly sure we don't. Um, there are small ways that we, can, that we can change our behaviors and do things to counteract, to mitigate some of the effects of, of increased carbon dioxide. But I think if we could really come up with green alternatives that are accessible to everyone, that would be so good for not only our species, but for all of the other ones that we share our planet with. Absolutely. Karen, now, first one, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Is it true that female ferrets can die if they don't have sex with males while on heat? Wow. Gosh, that's a great question. Mm. I, actually, that's a question I don't know the answer to, but I can see how there would be physiological issue for females that are uh, dropping eggs, that have a lot of eggs, they're gravid, that uh, don't get fertilized. I, I'm not sure if I've heard they can die, um, but you know, that's one I'm gonna have to look up a little more. It's, it's great because even though I study these things, I, there's still things that I learn every single day. I don't, don't know it all. Everything, Karen, <laughs> That's don't. That. <laughs> Great question. So, is there anything particular about female ferrets that we need to know about? Is there anything special about ferrets? Not that I would. No. <sighs> Hmm. Nothing that, that jumps out at me uh, from the recent literature. Um, you know, interestingly, they're not a very well-studied organism. They don't come up okay. a lot in the, in the literature, at least not in the literature relating to reproductive biology. Um, and that's, I, I wonder why. I don't know. Hmm. Maybe you should rectify that. Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs>
Is it true that the male redback can essentially commit suicide by twisting his abdomen onto the fangs of the female? Wow, you guys are amazing. These are tough questions. Uh, no, that's I, this one I am very intimately familiar with. Um, okay. So this is a this is such a, this is one of those crazy scenarios where uh, male redback spiders uh, do get sexually cannibalized by females, but they have two pedipalps or penile appendages that they can use to transfer sperm to a female. Now it makes more sense for them to want to use both of them uh, before they die. So, on their first reproductive attempt, they try to live, and yes, indeed, whoever asked this, wow, you deserve an A+. Uh, they constrict their abdomens, almost like a belt, like a corset, uh, and this has the effect of relocating their, their uh, vital organs to the periphery of the body, so that when they do that first roll into the female's jaws, they actually don't die. She'll bite them. But because his vital organs have been relocated temporarily, he's okay. Uh, now, the second time, when he goes in for his second copulation attempt, it's, it's, it's lights out. But their reproductive success or their biological fitness is actually increased by something like 30 to 40 percent by using this constricting technique on their first wow. run at it. Fantastic example. Great. Okay. Let's have a look at another question. What is the phenomenon called when kangaroos have multiple stages of development with their young at one time? Wow. Okay, so this would be the fact where they have had uh, one litter and then there is another litter that's just slightly older. Gosh, I know. So when, when female or when organisms have uh, many different uh, sexual broods, I guess you could say. This is called iteroparity. So you, they actually breed in iterations as opposed to organisms that are semilparous that only actually breed once. Uh, so I don't know that there's a term that specifically pertains to kangaroos, but I would say that because they are iteroparous, it's possible for them, like, like us humans, you know, for example, a lot of times um, female humans will still have a child on the breast and they'll be pregnant and that's physiologically no problem. Um, it happens in seals, sea lions, a lot of uh, large mammals. So, Have you had a chance to see any kangaroos while you've been here you in know, Australia? You know, not yet. Oh. Um, I haven't seen a lot of wildlife. I did see some beautiful sights when I was in Hobart, uh, but not yet. No kangaroos yet. All right, well, maybe there's still a little bit of time left. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> Uh, and next question, do echidnas have a four-headed penis? I love you guys. You guys are the best <laughs> audience ever. And these are the questions, why, these are the questions that adults are too afraid to ask. And I love it. I love that the kids are cool with this. Uh, yes, they do. We call it a quad. And um, they aren't the only, a lot of monotremes have these wacky penises. Um, and essentially they do only use one of them at a time. Uh, but it is, you know, it makes sense for, through their evolutionary process, to have evolved these four different ones. We were, we were talking a little bit about this this morning. Um, how, whether or not it might be to do with the fact that, that it is pretty tough for them because of all of their spines. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's possible that, you know, maybe some of the penises get <laughs> damaged. Um, but yes, they do have four, though they only do use one at once. Okay. Great questions. What is the scariest thing that has happened to you while you've been filming? Oh, wow. So I uh, filmed this really interesting show called uh, Stephen Hawking's Brave New World. And this is a show about emerging technologies. And so one of the, one of the big things that I had to do, I was in a, a place called Atlanta, Georgia, which is in the United States. And I was embedded with a virtual SWAT team. So there were, uh, we were looking at this virtual reality, this simulated reality technology. And um, all of the guys I was doing this with were ex-military, big guys, you know. And I had like a hundred sensors on my body and this big thing over my head. And we were just in an empty warehouse. But the technology was so real that it was like we were going upstairs, we were going around the corners. And, wow. um, and so basically what this was, was a hostage taking scenario. And my role was to be the chief of police. And um, I can see you as chief of police. Right? Yeah. yeah. Kicking some butt. Um, so, but all the guys knew what was going to happen. 
but I didn't know what was gonna happen. So they didn't tell me because that was part of the thing, right? So we're going and they're like, Bondar, clear the room on the left. And I've got this gun and I'm like, ah, okay, is there anybody in here? Like, oh, it was terrifying, even though it was virtual reality. It was so real. I felt like my heart was gonna burst out of my chest. I was sweating yeah. buckets. And then by the time we got to the last room, I got shot. And then they, the, it actually, the, the technology came with muscle stim pads. So when I got shot, I actually got mm. shot. And then I, I came out with bruises and I was like, wow, it was nutty. I mean, as far as animals go, I mean, I love the creepy crawlers. I've had tarantulas crawling on my face. I've had scorpions yeah. crawling down my shirt. Like, I, I don't have issues really with, with um, invertebrates. And um, at, at one point in, when I was shooting wild sex in South Africa, we were shooting an episode about elephants. And elephant females have this penile clitoris, this crazy structure. So we were talking about that. And one of the female elephants, this was on a reserve. It's not in a zoo or anything. She just came right over. Like, you know, I was just like, whoa, hello. Uh, but it was a cool shot, so I just kept going. Um, and I knew that there were handlers there um, to do yeah. any, you know, just in case if she did anything. But she didn't. She was just coming over and wafted herself at me a few times and then walked away. But it was a cool shot. It definitely made the final cut. An amazing experience. Yeah. Is there a creature that hasn't been captured on film that you would like to be the first one to capture it? Yeah, so we don't know very much at all about shark sex. In fact, we know virtually nothing. So something as you know charismatic megafauna as a great white, yeah. um, we don't know. We virtually know nothing about their sex lives because it's so hard to, to capture. I mean, these organisms live in very deep oceanic environments, and they're not exactly the you know they they also roam for you know extremely. Uh, great areas yeah, yeah exactly and um so it's something that we don't know which would be wonderful to know another one would be to get more on that hecticatellus that's it's almost like one of these great legendary stories in the biological sex world and um it's they're just so rare for us to see because they live in, the, in a place that we just can't easily get to. So I guess maybe what I'm what I'm getting at here is a lot of those oceanic creatures where it's just virtually impossible for us to know what they're doing down there. Now this next question is I find this quite interesting. The question is because you're a biologist and not a physicist or a chemist, do people not take your science as seriously mm. as those other, I guess, hard scientists right. that we yeah. have? So, you know, uh, yes, I suppose there are there are shades of that. My attitude in general towards anyone who has kind of any negative uh, impressions of my work or what I do or what I communicate or what anybody does. I guess I just have in my mind a real feeling of, you know, if you don't like it, you're, not, you're welcome to go and do something else. Um, the thing is, if we, if we don't understand a lot of things on a macro scale that animal biology helps us to understand, how can we really appreciate anything about ourselves? That doesn't necessarily mean we don't need, of course, physical sciences and chemical sciences, but what we need to really understand is that there is so much chemistry in biology. There's so much biology in chemistry. There's so much physics in biology and vice versa. These things aren't mutually exclusive. And I think when we start to uh, make hmm, judgments about who's doing what and is someone doing something that's more or less important, I think that's more a measure of someone's lack of confidence and maybe what they're doing. So, I mean, as with anybody who's doing something in a public way, I get a lot of, you know, flack, get a lot of commenters that, that don't say very nice things and whatever. Um, I, I tend to just don't not read them. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I tend to just be like, if you, do you like my work? Oh, super, let's talk. Do you not like my work? Okay. Well, have a great life. Bye. See ya. Yeah. I think that's a good tactic. Okay, a piece of advice that you would give to girls thinking about studying perhaps biology, but perhaps anything in the STEM area, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Sweet. What advice would you give? Do it. <laughs> Do it? <laughs> um, so as we t sort of touched on briefly before, yeah. as a young woman, I didn't take any science. And so I even said, you know, one of my, my uh, young babysitters, she's in her first year of university now, and she wasn't going to take any science. She was going to do history. And I was just like, you know, 
stay in, in, in high school, stay in your sciences. It's really no extra work for you. Well, it is extra work for you right now when you're in high school, but it's so much easier for you to go, okay, I'm in second year university, I'm gonna switch over to whatever, makeup, acting, who knows. If you have that science behind you, go for it, do whatever you want. But if you don't have the science behind you, it is so much harder for you to go, you know, I really wish that I could take chemistry now or I could take engineering now. Um, so that is because I did it like wrong, if you can say there is a wrong, um, I just strongly suggest to every girl, boy, everybody, just stay in science, stay in science. It's your high school teachers are there, they can help you, they can give you that support now, whereas when you get to a big university and you're doing first year and you're one of like 300 students in a class, you don't get that support, stay in science now, for sure. So what about girls in particular? Is there something that you wanna say in terms of, I don't know, coming from a dance mm. background, moving into the science? Is there anything that they need to be thinking about? Yeah, well, okay, I, so I did my PhD too in a very male-dominated uh, sphere. I, I, was, I, I did stream ecology, population ecology, but I was actually in the Faculty of Forestry, um, which was this, uh, you know, it's just under the umbrella in which the, the forest sciences fell. And um, so it was all about steak and beer and, you know, it was men and, you know. Um, I guess I... I would say, please don't be intimidated. Um, there, there isn't, there, there certainly is, I guess, a lack of equality in a lot of fields, but that doesn't mean you have no business being anywhere you would like to be. Um, don't apologize for yourself if you're interested in taking a certain subject and you may be the only woman in the room. Um, I recently had my eldest son at a basketball camp and for whatever reason, this basketball camp was just for for boys and one of my girlfriends had her daughter there and they were like you know she wants to take that let her take basketball camp so they did and I was like good for her you know just going okay I'm the only girl and there's like a hundred boys in this room but I don't care let's play basketball and and I thought to myself when do we lose that when yeah. do we lose the ability to just not care about that because I know probably a lot of girls at high school age would feel too intimidated um, and so, yep, you're gonna probably, because it's human nature and it's okay, you're allowed, but also don't be forced to apologize for anything that you wanna do. Um, and again, if you have specific questions pertaining to anything like that, also feel free to email me or send me a tweet because I know those kinds of situations can be really tough. I think that's great advice and you're a great role model. Thank you, Anytime. appreciate that. <laughs> Now, someone wants to know specifically about your PhD. Mm -hmm. What was the topic or the question that you looked at for your studies? So I've always been very interested in the process of development. Um, and so my PhD looked at how um, the ecology of an organism or the how an organism interacts with both the biotic, alive and abiotic factors in its environment, um, how does that change through development? And so I looked at a small stream community and I looked at crayfish, uh, which are freshwater, uh, I guess, do you call them lobster here? Yeah. Freshwater lobster, okay, we call them crayfish. Uh, in New Zealand, they call them kura, and I did part of my PhD work in New Zealand. So, um, and I essentially found that the young, the small crayfish were ecologically quite different and distinctive from the adults. And this makes, you know, this means that we have to think about food webs and organisms and populations as, as fluid mixtures of different kinds of contributors especially with organisms that don't have a lot of parental care. You know, so the juveniles, they're not really interacting with the adults, so they're doing something totally different from the adults. They're eating different prey. Uh, they're doing different things to the environment. So that was basically the gist of what I looked at. Very good. Okay, this is a, an interesting question. Far more interesting than the last time I said that that was an interesting question. <laughs> If you could be any animal because of their sex life, oh. <laughs> which one would you pick? Nice. Well done. Wow. All right, let me think about that. You see, in a lot of cases, because of all the violence, mm. um, you know, it makes me go, wow, am I ever happy I am a human? Um, however, female earwigs seem to really enjoy sex. Mm. Um, Male earwigs have either really long or really short penile appendages. And biologists have repeatedly observed that females go for the males that have the really long ones. 
even though it takes them a lot more time to inseminate her. Yep. But they've re they have actually concluded that it's because it stimulates her a little better. So maybe it's good to be a bed, uh, an ear <laughs> An ear wig. Well. <laughs> now, I'm going to have to think about that, though. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a really good question. It is. I mean, you know, you get to things like mammals and especially primates, and you see examples where sex is taking place for the sake of sex. Humans, bonobos, uh, a lot of macaques, lots of primates. We like having sex. It's fun. It's a way to reduce tension. Um, and so I guess we're the ones enjoying it the most. Although a lot of mammals are, a lot of, like dolphins. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of sex there. Um, so any animal where sex is fun. Okay, uh, another question. What do you want to do with the rest of your career? Have you got any amazing highlights? Is there something particular that you want to study? Is there something that you want to achieve? I have a lot of ideas. Um, so my the next major thing that I'm completing is my book. It's titled Wild Sex. And um, I have another few months to complete it, and that should be out next year. So that once I finish that, I'm going to have a lot more time to step back, take a breath, relax. Um, I'm meant to be uh, doing a new Animal Planet series uh, later on in the fall. Um, I also work quite a bit in San Francisco for Discovery Digital Networks, uh, for DNews, which is super fun. I also have some really massive art projects in my mind right now. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, there's just, I love to kind of see where the, where the world takes me. Um, and so far it's taken me in some pretty amazing directions. And so being a freelancer um, gives me a great deal of flexibility to either say yes to projects or not. Um, and so, you know, I, th there's something really lovely about not necessarily knowing, but knowing it'll be awesome. What connections do you see between art and science, oh, if you see any? I see many. In fact, I see them so intimately linked uh, that there really isn't one without the other. And I think particularly in my appreciation of natural beauty, all of these wonderful creatures that we looked at today, um, the beauty with which they move, with which they sing, with which they interact with each other, that's art. Um, to me it is. And, you know, there's just no shortage. I will never run out of examples of something that just moves me um, in a way that, that maybe is, is wacky <laughs> to some, but I could, you know, I could watch a nudibranch. You know, if I'm out on a, on a dive and I see a nudibranch crawling along, that's it for me. Like, I could just sit there the rest of the dive and stay down for, you know, my air will last <laughs> like four times as long as anybody else because I could just watch it move. And it would be so wonderful to see more um, interaction between art, dance, uh, music, movement. And I think there's a lot of people doing really amazing work that's looking at that. And I, you know, I see that as a potential direction for me as well. And perhaps our last question, what were you like as a child? Were you into biology, collecting bugs? What were you like? Yeah, that's me. That's who I was. I was always a performer, so I did grow up as a dancer. I, I couldn't wait to start dancing lessons. I started when I was five. Um, and I was always the one out there getting dirty, um, collecting worms, collecting crabs on the beach, hosting my own little shows <laughs> on the on the beach, no, not knowing a thing that I was talking about, but you know, just hosting them all the same. Um, yeah, I was always out there, and my youngest daughter is definitely following in those footsteps with me. She'll just, you know, hey, look at that slug. I wonder what it tastes like. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's nice to see that kind of uh, coming around again. But yeah, I was the adventurer for sure. Wonderful. Well, I hope there are lots of students like you, adventurers out there so. watching this afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Karen, thank you. It's been wonderful getting to know you thank and getting you. to know your area of science. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.